book of 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to cover three verses today. Three verses! So if we take three verses per message, it will take a while to get through this book. I turned it off. Bring it over here. Didn't that go off? You can cut my finger off and take it down with you if you want. Come on. Siri comes up. Come on. Ooh, something happened. It won't go off. There you go. All right, let's jump into this. First Thessalonians. So Paul talks in here about their work of faith and their labor of love. So I tried to find some jokes dealing with with work, and I got some. I got some comics dealing with work. Okay, uh, here I got. In fact, I got several of them. Uh, so a humorous anecdote about work. Here's the first one. Uh, you should check your emails more often. I fired you over three weeks ago. <laughs> and the guy is still coming to work regularly because he never checked his email. Second one. Here's another one I say. It says, uh, our computers are down, so we have to do everything manually. You see what they're doing? They're literally playing their solitaire manually with real cards <laughs> rather than playing with the computer solitaire. Here's one more. I like this one. The boss comes up and the boss says, why aren't you working? And the worker says, I didn't see you coming. <laughs> so in other words, if he'd seen him coming, he'd have started working, or at least look like he's, he's working there. Yeah. So, all right. So we're going to look at our text. I got out there. I have, I know it's on plain paper. I spoiled you with the, with the card stock, but um, the first, uh, an outline for our text. I hope you picked one of those up. Here's our text, verses 1 through 3. How come I got 1 through 4 up there? Well, we'll see. Paul, Silvanus, actually another Latin way of saying Silas, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for you, for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus. Okay, so there's our text for today. Here's my outline, as you see here. Yeah, I got some blanks. You can fill that in. First of all... The opening to the letter. When we write a letter, we have an opening. Dear so-and-so. Well, back an ancient letter, uh, they had it a little bit different. Second point, uh, we got a glimpse of Paul's prayer life in verse 2. So we're going to talk about a little bit about Paul's prayer for all of those early churches that he was planting. A glimpse of Paul's prayer life. And then a double blank on your sheet. The labor and steadfastness of the Thessalonian believers. Last week we covered how Paul had come into that city. He had preached the gospel. It was a significant call. Um, it was a significant place because it was right on a major trading route in the Roman Empire. God, through the Macedonian call, had called Paul to this area and Paul preached, and people got saved, and he started the church, and then there was a riot. The Jews hired some, some, some thugs, basically, and they caused a riot, and Paul left Thessalonica, and there was this group of basically baby Christians that the Lord um, grew into a good, strong church. All right, so opening to a letter, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, I have broken this down here, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now, many, for some reason, the Lord has decided that most of our New Testament is made up of what we call epistles or letters. They are letters that people, Peter and John, and especially Paul, wrote to various churches. 
The way Paul began his letters was very similar, and he would, it, it was very common for the letters of that day. When we write a letter, we put the date at the top usually, and then we say, dear so-and-so, and then we have the main body of the letter, and then we sign it, you know, with love or sincerely, and we put our name. That's the common form of a letter in our day and age. But this is the common form on which letters took place back in the first century A.D. I say this is a normal opening to a letter in the New Testament times. They would start with the sender, then the recipient, then a greeting, which was probably better than the way we do it. I remember getting a letter and it said, Dear John. Yeah, I got a lot of Dear John letters in my day. But, uh, and I, w I hadn't looked at the return address on the envelope. It was a personal letter. Somebody, e somebody mailed to me. And I got it, and I was expecting a letter from somebody, so I had in my mind it was from them. And I opened the letter, and dear John, and I started reading it, and coming from this person, there were some odd things in there, things that didn't make sense. Why was this person saying these things? And then I got down to the bottom, and it said, with love, and it was from somebody else that I didn't realize. You know, they did it much better. They started off with who it's from. Oh, this letter's from Paul. He's writing it. So they knew right off who the letter was from. Right? And then they would state the recipients of the letter, and then they would give a greeting. Okay, When we meet somebody, we say, hello, hello, Dan. How are you, we might add, or something, and we really don't mean it. I was going to, you know, but we got to start off with something to get the conversation rolling, you know. Um, I was going to look up where the roots of our word hello came from, and I didn't do that, but we often have a greeting, um, as Paul has a greeting to them. Paul is obviously the author, but isn't it interesting, Silas and Timothy, we talked last week about how Paul had preached on Myers Hill, and, and then he left Athens. He was by himself there in Athens, and he went to Corinth, and Silas and him had planned to meet up in Corinth, and they met up in Corinth, and then Timothy had come from Thessalonica to give a report on how the Thessalonians were doing. So as Paul writes this letter, it's obviously from Paul, but Paul includes Silas and Timothy because that was the group that the Thessalonians knew, and Paul included them in his, um, in his introduction as well. This letter is from Paul, Timothy, and Silas. Okay, more comments about it. Here's some other things I said. Notice that he calls them a church. Paul came to Thessalonica, Paul preached, some people got saved. They entered what we call the body of Christ, or the universal church. You go to the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about the, what we call the universal church. Every believer since the day of Pentecost until the rapture takes place is a part of the universal church. But, the universal church is, you don't see it. What you see, the way the Lord manifests it, is in local churches. Paul established a local church here in Thessalonica. They were a group of young believers who had just come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul had them start meeting regularly. Paul taught them principles about the new Christian life. Paul taught them how to live the Christian life, taught them some doctrine, taught them that Jesus was coming back again. That's going to be a major um, theme in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And Paul organized them. There were The Lord raised up some leaders, and they eventually became the elders. And then there were people who helped in the ministry. They became deacons. And God established a local church in Thessalonica, just like we are, meeting together regularly, trying to evangelize our area, teaching the Word of God, 
encouraging and edifying one another as a local church. Paul calls them a church, an ecclesia, called out ones. In the New Testament, as believers got saved in various Gentile cities, they formed a local church. Notice he says, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's kind of interesting he says it that way, both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's really kind of hitting a couple of groups there. Uh, this separates them from the unsaved Gentiles who were idol worshipers a little later on. In fact, in chapter 1, he says, you turn from idols to the living God. So the Gentiles, they turn from their idols, and he mentions that um, not only in God the Father, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, because there were Jews in the church there as well. In in the book of Acts, chapter 17, we looked at that text last week. When Paul preached the gospel, he first went to the synagogue, argued that Jesus was the Messiah. There were some Jews that got saved. Then Paul preached to the general public of Gentiles, and there were Gentiles that got saved. In fact, in the book of Acts, it mentions three groups. I don't know if you remember those from the text last week. There were some Jews that got saved. There were some... Gentiles, there were some Greeks that got saved, some, what's the word, devout Greeks, Greeks that were worshiping the Jewish God, there were devout Greeks that got saved, and then it says some prominent women got saved. That's kind of interesting that Luke mentions that as he writes the book of Acts. So they all began to meet together, both Jew and Gentile, and formed this local church in Thessalonica. Paul saw, taught them for a couple months probably, and then there was that riot. Paul had to leave, and there they are, a bunch of Christians who had just been saved for two, three months maybe. We don't know how long it was, and they're on their own, you know? Uh, a bunch of baby Christians. Well, what do we do now? Well, the Lord was leading them and grew them into a good, strong local church. Paul's unusual greeting. Here's, here's the greeting. Paul, in most of his letters, would write, write grace and peace as his greeting remark. Nowhere else in ancient letters, in fact, I was reading a book this week uh, on the internet about, there was a scholar who wrote about the greetings in ancient letters. Um, nowhere is this combination grace and peace put together by any other author than the Apostle Paul, which I think is kind of interesting. But Paul did that for a reason. Here's the reason. This is unusual. It is a hybrid of the Gentile greeting and the Jewish greeting. The Gentiles would usually write grace to you. Now, they didn't, the unsaved Gentile didn't mean that word grace in the same way that Christians mean the word grace. They were idol worshipers, and when they greeted somebody in a letter and they said grace to you, what they meant was, may the gods bring blessing into your life. That's really what they were saying. The gods of the, of the pantheon were kind of fickle gods, and sometimes they'd get mad at people and, and throw hard times at them because they were mad at them, or sometimes they would, they would send blessings down on people. They, they were somewhat fickle, you know? So they would, the Gentiles who believed in these idols, believed in the pantheon of, of Greek and Roman gods, they would say, grace to you. The Jews would often write the word peace. Now, Paul uses the Greek form of peace here, but you know, even today, if you go to Israel, their common greeting to you is shalom. Yeah, and the word shalom, you know, we think peace, uh, absence of war, or we think of, you know, a calmness of our heart. That might be a good way of defining peace. But the word shalom meant a wholeness of your life. May your life be complete and made whole. That's what the Jewish word shalom means. So Paul knew that the church, almost all of the churches where he went, there was a minority of Jews that got saved and a bunch of Gentiles got saved and they would make up those local churches 
And so Paul would send the greeting, Grace, you Gentiles, and peace, you Jewish believers in that local church. And he would combine the two, grace to you and peace. I said, Paul combined the two in the greeting because there were both Jews and Gentiles in that local church. All right, let's go on. Uh Uh-oh, grace. I want to talk about the word grace. I went to an online theological dictionary, and you're going to see. Well, no, I'll I'll talk about it later. It says, this is a quote from there. I didn't put the quotes around it, but this comes directly from the online theological dictionary. I think it was Baker's Evangelical Theological Dictionary. They have it online. Grace is unmerited favor. It is different than justice and mercy. I I like the, you know, these three words, justice, mercy, and grace. He, He distinguishes the three. Justice is getting what we deserve. Okay, a rebellious, sinful people in relationship to a holy and righteous God. If it was going to be justice, we deserve eternal damnation. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. So instead of justice from the Lord, we get mercy, meaning God withholds sending believers to hell. That would be just to send us to hell, but God is merciful and he withholds that. But grace, mercy is getting what we do not. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. Blessings uh, from the Lord, uh, a new life, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Word of God. Local churches are a blessing, a grace from the Lord. God gives to us great grace. Now, I know you kind of, you've been a believer for any length of time. You've heard the word grace, and you know it means God's unmerited favor. In fact, later he says this in the article. Because of God's loving love and kindness manifested in Christ on the cross, we receive the great blessing of redemption. Grace is, and you've seen this probably, this acronym, kind of a neat acronym, a very accurate acronym. Sometimes acronyms aren't that accurate, but this is a very accurate acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense is God's grace. God gives us grace because Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. Grace rules out all human merit. It is a product of God that is given by God because of who he is and not because of who you are, we are. It is a means of salvation. And again, this is a quote from the online theological dictionary about grace. God gives to us grace. We should be thankful every day for the grace that God gives to us. Here's a cross-reference. I like putting in cross-references. Cross-references are other verses in the Bible that maybe expand our understanding of that concept. Here's one in Romans. Romans chapter 5, the whole context is that through Adam, all people died through Adam. But through God's grace, Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can live again. Romans 5, 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through the one man's trespass, talking about Adam, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The word grace appears in there several times. And free gift is probably a synonym for the word grace. We receive grace from God. We need to realize realize that grace. Get up in the morning and begin to think of all the blessings you have. A wonderful soft bed. Warm quilts. You throw those back. You got air to breathe. You got a nice home. You got a Keurig coffee maker out there in the kitchen that you can go make yourself a cup of coffee to have in the morning. Coffee in the morning, you know? And all of that are just what we call common grace. We all have that. And then we have the special grace that we have in Jesus Christ, a new life, a home in heaven, 
um, knowing that God is working all things together for good. You know, we could really be mad over this building that we want to rent. We want to get out of this place. We want to, to rent that storefront. And all of a sudden, a bunch of obstacles get in our way, and we could go, Ugh, we are mad about that. But you know what? God is in control. God is closing that door because he is a good God, and he has something better for us grace. God gives us grace. I want to think about that word peace. I didn't, I didn't go to the theological dictionary for that, that word peace, but, but this, is, this is a, if you think of the word peace, you ought to think of the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, Paul says this, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. He says, do not be anxious. If you look at these two verses, anxiety is the opposite of peace. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, prayer is the cure for worry, anxiety, everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Pray about it. Mixing thanksgiving in there, but pray about it. You're worried. Oh, I'm worried. With thanksgiving, bring those requests to God. And then he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, you won't even understand how that peace has come, but the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God will give you peace. Paul says to the Thessalonians, God's grace be with you, and God's peace be on you. Now, right after this, I, I skipped verse 8. I really shouldn't have skipped verse 8, but verse 9. So notice here it says the peace of God. Another cross-reference, Philippians 4, 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Isn't that interesting? In verse 7, Paul says the peace of God, and now in verse 9, he says the God of peace. The God of peace will be with you to give you the peace of God. Good cross-reference for that word. Paul says grace and peace be to you. All right, number two, a glimpse of Paul's prayer life. Verse 2, Paul says we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Is there another part of that verse? No. All right, so, well, let me get into what I say here. Give, uh, this gives a glimpse into Paul's prayer life. As Paul traveled around the Gentile world, he planted churches. He'd, he'd preach, people would get saved, he'd begin to teach them, he'd get them organized into a local church, and then he would move on, and there was that local church left behind. Uh, Thessalonica wasn't unique. This happened all the time. Paul, sometimes Paul stayed longer. <laughs> sometimes Paul had to move on because of persecution very quickly and in a very short time. And there is this local church full of young believers. Many, like the Thessalonian church, was full of young Christians. The believing Jews had some Old Testament background, but, for, but most were fresh out of paganism and idol worship. And Paul left them. There they are. And Paul would think about them. I was going to say Paul would worry about them, but no, he didn't. Because <laughs> he left them in God's hands. He wrote Philippians 4, 7 and 8. He didn't worry about them, but he was concerned for them, and Paul would pray for them. I see here, but he would remember these churches, and it seems he would constantly pray for these churches, the leadership and the people he knew in them. He had received the Macedonian call here on his second missionary journey. He was already praying for those churches he planted on the first missionary journey, and he'd received the Macedonian call. He'd gone to Lystra, started the church there, took Timothy with him from Lystra. He went to Philippi. He started a church there. 
You remember Lydia in Philippi, a seller of purple. They met at the river to pray, and Paul started the church through them. He got arrested, got thrown in jail, and then the Philippian jailer got saved and started meeting with the believers. Paul remembered that church, and then Paul went to Thessalonica. We looked at that text last week. He preached. The Jews got jealous. Uh, they started a riot. This poor Jason, think of Jason, a new young Christian. He gets arrested. He gets brought before the judge. They fine him all because he had accepted Jesus as his Savior. And Paul would pray for them. Paul would think about them and be concerned for them because false doctrine could come in, persecution could come in, all kinds of things Satan would, didn't like these local churches being planted throughout the Gentile world. Satan had them in his clutches. They were idol worshipers. And now Paul is bringing the kingdom of God into the Gentile world. Satan would do whatever he could to, to crush and to demoralize and to sidetrack these local churches. But Paul would pray for them. Lord, I pray that you will take care of that Thessalonian church, keep them on track, help them to grow, help them to see people saved, help them to do what's right, turning from idols and serving you. He would pray for them. He mentions he would pray for them with thankfulness. I wonder how much thankfulness you have in your prayer life. Uh, I say here, I am sure he prayed for their needs, their spiritual needs. In fact, some of the epistles gives us the needs that he would pray for. I don't know if you remember, but in the book of Philippians, in chapter 1 and in chapter 3, Paul literally states the prayer that he would pray for the Ephesian church. So he tells us sometimes what he prays for them. It wasn't for... Aunt Sally's bunion surgery coming up. It was spiritual requests he would make for those churches. But he always thanks the Lord for those believers. We need to be thankful in our prayer life, but we most of all need to be thankful not for the things, the blessings the Lord gives us, but we need to be thankful for fellow Christians that have come across our lives and our paths. I know what, it's hard. These people at Anchor Community Church can be kind of hard people to put up with at times, huh? But we need to be thankful for them. The Lord has put them in your life for a purpose. The Lord makes up local churches for, with certain people for a reason. And we need to be thankful for them. I said here, these people were rescued out of the clutches of Satan and hell and now serve the true and living God. Paul was thankful for those Thessalonian believers. All right, now we'll get to the, oh, I got to watch my time here. Point number three, the labor and steadfastness of the Thessalonian believers. Paul gives us three things here. He says, remembering before our God and Father, here's the first one. Your, he's talking to the Thessalonians. He wrote this letter to the Thessalonians. And he says, I remember when I pray for you, I remember your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So three things there. Yeah, if I was a normal preacher, that would be a nice three-point sermon right there. You know, and I've, <laughs> I've seen this preached on a nice three-point sermon because they had in their lives a work of faith, they had a labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. Isn't that, isn't that a good outline? Now, isn't it interesting? What's the difference between work and labor? Well, I looked that up. There's two words uh, in the Greek, one that's translated as work and one that's translated as labor. The first one, work, is the, word, is the Greek word ergon. We have a unit of measurement for power, for work, that's called an erg. Well, that has come from this Greek word. We have the study of how things work most efficiently. Ergonomics, okay, from this Greek word. Okay, ergon is a Greek word for work. Uh, this is directly from the lexicon. 
uh, to work, toil, and act, deed, doing, labor, work. Okay? Um, with this word, though, the emphasis is on uh, what is accomplished, the work. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do a task and it's going to accomplish something. Okay? That's the emphasis of this word. The second word he uses is koros. It means trouble, toil, labor, laborious toil, increasing weariness and fatigue. Okay? And the emphasis here is on how difficult, how hard the work is. So the one, when he uses the word work, he's emphasizing what's being accomplished. The other one, he's emphasizing how difficult it is. I drive up to Ferris two days a week. So I'm taking 131 north in the morning, and I'm taking 131 back south from Big Rapids to Grand Rapids in the late afternoon, evening. They are doing work up there. In fact, the whole northbound expressway is gone. They've tore it all up. The bed, the, the ground, the bedwork is still there, but there's no pavement on it. And so they shift the traffic on northbound. You get up to about, what is it, six mile road post drive. And just after that, you shift and you go for about five, six, seven miles before Cedar Springs, you shift back again. It took me several trips before I noticed this, but I noticed something. Now they have great big concrete barriers between, because you're both on the same lanes there, the northbound and the southbound, they have these great big concrete barriers, okay? I noticed something. Took me a couple days to notice it. Going up in the morning, of course most of the traffic is heading to Grand Rapids, right? Going up in the morning, I have one lane, the southbound traffic has two lanes, okay? I've crossed over from my northbound, I've crossed over here, and I have one lane, and they have two lanes. And then one, after I'd driven that for a couple of days after Ferris started, I thought, wait a minute here. Coming south in the late afternoon, northbound has two lanes, and southbound only has one lane. You know what that means? That means that somewhere in the middle of the day, they take all those big concrete barriers and they shift them over a lane. Whoa! Talk about labor! <laughs> Toilsome labor! And then sometime in the middle of the night, they shift them all back again for morning traffic. In the morning, there's two lanes coming south in the town. There's one lane going up. Of course, I'm going the opposite way. Late afternoon, my class gets out in Big Rapids at, at uh, 4.15. By the time I get down to Cedar Springs, it's a quarter to five. And I've got one lane going south, and they got two lanes for all the traffic coming out of work and getting out of work. They shift all of those concrete barriers back and forth twice a day. Now, I did notice at the end of the, of the construction, there's this big vehicle. It's four wheels, but it sets real high, and it's got these things underneath. So it's actually a guy who just kind of drives along, and I don't know if it picks him up or if it pushes. I've never seen it actually do it. Have you seen it working? It picks him up, and it slides him over a lane. So twice a day, he goes down and shifts it over, and then in the middle of the night, he comes back again. That, that, that fascinated me. You know, I was thinking about labor. Talk about toil and hard work. Probably this machine makes it pretty easy. All the driver does is just drive it down there. But those are big concrete barriers. Now, they're not the big 20-footers. They're just little short three-footers, and they are connected. So I think they're somewhat flexible, and they just kind of just push. Yeah, they're connected, and they, but they're flexible at that connection, and they just kind of shift them over. But it made me think of what a lot of work shifting those cement barriers back and forth. Toil, huh? These Philippians, they were working and accomplishing something for the Lord, but they toiled hard at it. They had a work of faith and a labor of love. 
Okay, the other word, Thessalonians, faith and love. They were doing the work of faith and a labor of love. They served the Lord hard and by faith, believing the Lord would bless their work. That was the faith that was involved. Lord, we're going to do this, and we're going to trust you. We're going to trust you with the results. They loved those around them, and they wanted to see them saved, so they worked in love for others. You've heard that phrase. We've often talked about a labor of love. And we need to do that. We need to have love for other people. You know what? If we want to do, if you want to do an act of kindness for somebody else, it's going to cost you something. It's going to be some kind of an act that's going to interrupt your time. And it's going to, I won't tell you who it is, but Laurel got on the phone with a lady, a lonely elderly lady last night called her while she was sleeping, and Laurel gets up 4.30, got to leave at 6 o'clock for work, and Laurel thought she'd get a quick, <laughs> a quick call in, and I could hear this lady, and she was going on and on and on and on, and Laurel has to get ready to go to work, and, and Laurel is trying to get a word in, but this lady just keeps going on and on and on, you know, and and Laura finally says, hey, I'm sorry, I have to get ready for work, you know. And, and, but it was an act of kindness to call her back because she's a lonely elderly lady, wanted to talk. You can tell she doesn't have much of a chance to talk because if she gets somebody on the phone, she's gonna, you're going to be on the phone for 40 minutes. Labors of love are costly. But we need to be willing to love other people, doing acts of kindness. Cross-reference, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, here it is, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Here's another cross-reference, Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. The Thessalonian Christians had a work of faith and a labor of love, and they had a steadfastness of hope. The word steadfast. Hupomone. It means hypo. You see that prefix. It means to be under. It means to remain under great pressure. That's what steadfastness is. To remain under great pressure. Here's Strong's Dictionary. Cheerful or hopeful endurance, constancy, enduring, patient, patient, continuance, waiting. Here's Thayer's. Thayer's is another Greek lexicon. He says this, steadfastness, constancy, endurance. Let me illustrate this word. There was an automobile accident. The driver was pinned under the car, and the car started on fire. Actually, it wasn't the driver of the car. A motorcycle hit the car head on, and it was the motorcycle driver who was pinned under the automobile. It happened, I don't know if you remember that, a year or so back. A number of different bypassers came to help. They got down under the edge of the car and tried to lift it off the pinned man. Okay, you see a picture of them trying to do that there. This is illustrating this word, okay? One, but one saw the flames and said, it is going to explode. He ran back to safety, leaving the others who remained lifting that car. So there was one less person lifting because he got worried, he got scared, and he ran back. But the other men managed to lift the vehicle off the driver and pull him free and pull him back to safety. You can see right there, they are pulling him out from underneath that car. All of these guys had lifted that car, they pulled him out, and eventually this fire on the motorcycle got into the car and the whole car was on fire. That guy would have been killed had they not done that. They are an illustration of steadfastness, lifting, remaining under pressure. The Thessalonians, I say here, 
Just like most of those bypassers at the accident, I said, I said here most because that one guy ran back. It wasn't all of them. Like most of the bypassers in the accident, the Thessalonian Christians remained steadfast. The story in Acts about the church's founding, Jason and other brothers, it says under there, underwent persecution. They were arrested by this, by this mob and they were brought before the city leaders. They were fined. Can you imagine a new young baby Christian all of a sudden, why am I being persecuted? All I did was receive Jesus as my Savior, and now I'm under persecution for it. But he remained steadfast. Paul will mention in this book further persecution that they were undergoing in Thessalonica. Yet, they remained faithful to the Lord. They remained steadfast. Okay, so a work of faith, a labor of love, and a steadfastness of hope. One more word I want to talk about. I want to talk about the word hope. I went to Baker's Dictionary of Theology. New Testament uses the word elpizo and the noun ellipsis. Paul writes, uh, yeah, Paul writes about setting our hope in Christ. Paul announces that Jesus is our hope. A couple of cross-references there. New Testament hope, listen, this sounds theological. It's from a theological dictionary, but this is important. In New Testament, hope is primarily eschatological. Whoa, Pastor Herrick, what does that word mean? Eschatology is the study of end things. Hope is always, when we place our hope in Jesus Christ, in the New Testament, it is always looking to that second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, eschatology, end times. When he says that they were as steadfast in hope, that word hope referred to their knowing that Jesus Christ would come back again someday. This theological dictionary goes on. When our believing friends die, we grieve in hope of the Lord's return. Unlike believers, who have no hope. You go to a funeral of a believer, though we are sad because they are gone, we know they're in heaven, and we know we'll see them again someday. That's what hope means in the New Testament. The only sure hope is Jesus. When he returns, believers who have died and those who still live will both be given imperishable bodies like that of the risen Lord. Major passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul will talk about this in detail. All right, so I want you to remember, grace, peace, work of faith, labor of love, steadfast in hope. All right, closing up here. How is your prayer life? Do you remember your fellow believers in your life or in your past and pray for them? You know what you ought to have? <laughs> Here I say what you ought to have. I do have this at home. You ought to make a list of all of your fellow members of Anchor Community Church and you ought to pray for them every day. I say, how is your labor of love? Do you do acts of kindness to others, even though it may inconvenience you? Uh, I was coming home from the meeting yesterday. I go up Mondays and Wednesdays up to Big Rapids, and then Saturday I have to go up to a meeting for Woodland Baptist Association. I'm coming home. I was tired, I didn't feel very well, my foot hurt, I was ornery, and I'm in this lane construction, and I only had one lane heading south, and they had this on-ramp. And I'm coming down there, and, and I'm close to the car in front of me, and there's a guy coming on this on-ramp, and I says to myself, I'm not letting them in here. I'm staying right on the tail of the guy in front of me. They can just pull in behind me. <laughs> and then I said to myself, why am I so ornery? John, let the guy in. You know, and I backed off and I, I let him in. We need, to, we need to be patient with people. We need to do acts of kindness for them. How is your work of faith? Are you doing service for the Lord and not seeing results? 
Do you maintain by faith that the Lord will produce results in His time? He will. Are you steadfast? Do you jump from one job to another, or do you remain with a service for the Lord, continuing to do it even though it is tough? Steadfast. Remember these words, grace and peace, and remember a work of faith, a labor of love, and a steadfastness of hope. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray uh, for this introduction to this book. I pray as we go through this book, Father, we will see the important doctrines there. Father, help us to have steadfastness. Help us to have uh, love in our lives for others. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith, love, and hope.